Hey there, this is Henry. And Kristen. And we are here on behalf of Midtown Comics at the Society of Illustrators at the wonderful Excelsior World of Stan Lee exhibit, which has been curated here at the Society of Illustrators, highlighting the life and impact of Stan Lee, who of course, I mean, he's the biggest name comics ever saw. He revolutionized the way that public perception is for comics and everything like that. So it's really wonderful to see a lot of work here contributing to his legacy. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's really great. We get to see lots of great stuff from uh, longtime collaborators, John Romita, uh, Domasima, Jack Kirby, and wonderful stuff. And we have here with us writer, editor, and comic historian, the biographer of Stan Lee, Danny Fingeroff. Uh, Danny, you can come on over and say hi sure. to the world. Okay, well, I've got to get past the crew and all the lights <laughs> and everything. So, Hello, okay. Danny, why oh, don't you? In front of you. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell everybody uh, out in the world a little bit about yourself? Okay. Well, I was a writer and editor at Marvel for about uh, ten thousand years. <laughs> I'm best known for uh, working on the Spider-Man books and Darkhawk and uh, also the X-Men, Dazzler, Iron Man. Um, and uh, the past uh, number of years, I've been working as a historian. I write books like uh, Superman on the Couch. Should I mm -hmm. look at you or them or what am I? Yeah, no, at? you can okay. look right out to the world. Oh, okay. And uh, <laughs> and currently, I'm working on a biography of Stan Lee for St. Martin's Press. It's called A Marvelous Life. It should be out later this year. And. Uh, so I guess they thought that I would be an appropriate person since I've yeah. worked with Stan and I've known you, you might Stan. Know, you might know a thing or two. And, year, so, uh, and I have a million uh, historical stories, some of them interesting. You know, I guess you'll, that's up to you whether they're really interesting <laughs> or not. And uh, so they were uh, kind enough to ask me to come take you on a little tour through the Society of Illustrators well, Stanley Exhibition. Fantastic. I mean, I couldn't think of anybody that would be better suited because you literally wrote the book or you're writing the uh, book on yes. Stan Lee. Actually, you'll see another book that I did with Roy Thomas about Stan as we go through. So. Ah, so then fantastic. We've got lots to look yes. forward to. So we're going to walk around. We'll show okay. off some of the cool art. And, uh, this we'll is not rehearsed, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll just swing on over. We'll start at the end and we'll start walking okay. around. Okay. Um, oh, this, this is the... You can't see the cover, but this is the Stanley Universe, which is a book I did with Roy Thomas for uh, Tomorrow's Publishing. It's got a lot of rare material from Stan's archives at the University of Wyoming, and uh, all sorts of interviews, artifacts. Uh, it'll fill you in on a lot of history. So it's not a biography per se, but it's kind of a scrapbook uh, with hours and hours and hours of reading. Well, that's pretty cool. And of course, we get to see uh, young whippersnapper uh, Stanley, you know? Yes, barely 40. Barely 40. That's right. Um, <laughs> and uh, some other books, the Jack yeah. Kirby book, a bunch of stuff. I love seeing uh, a lot Jack, of yes. the stuff like this because it really gives us uh, just a sampling of the impact of Stanley and how much he meant to Marvel and the comic book industry because, you know, Stan did a little bit of everything and seeing it all in actual tangible form like that I think is pretty fantastic. Uh, well, Stan had a long life and a long career. He started in comics at, with uh, Timely, which is the precursor to Marvel, in uh, 1940 when he was 18 years old. And uh, he was associated with them and worked with and for them till he passed away when he was almost 96. Yeah. So shall we look at some artwork? Yeah, let's look at some art. This is the uh, Mike Berkey collection, I believe. Yes. All this stuff. And this is really great to start us off. We've got yes. some art by Don Heck here from some classic... Art by uh, Don Heck. So Stan was the writer and uh, editor on this and art director, I guess. He had all those titles at one point <laughs> uh, before Marvel was a very small skeleton staff. Uh, Don Heck was one of his mainstay artists, and um, so you can see Marvel. Stan was, if not the first to give credits to uh, the artists as well as himself, he gave credits in a prominent way. It wasn't a little signature or a tiny box in the corner. It was, uh, it was uh, right in your face. He made, he made celebrities of all the people who worked for Marvel. He, he created this sense of there being a Marvel bullpen. Right. Marvel had had bullpens in the 40s and 50s, but by the time the 60s came around, they were a tiny room, 
maybe they graduated later to two rooms, <laughs> and all the artists worked at home as freelancers. But Stan created this imaginary bullpen where, as a kid, you would think that, oh, all these people are working together, drawing in there, pulling practical jokes on each other, and they're telling each other's live stories, and they're having fun. Um, but really, it was Stan and Flo Steinberg and Sal Brodsky yeah. in like two rooms with, uh, and then they grew over time. But at this point, uh, this is from 1965, so it's before Roy Thomas even came to work there. Um, and you can see the art is very large. You'll see some more recent art that's smaller. This is what's called Twice Up. And, and this is, this is a, just an artboard. It was a story that was um, probably done in what's called Marvel Method, where Stan and the artist would plot out the, uh, the beats of the story, and the artist would go home and draw it, and then Stan would come in and write the uh, dialogue, the balloons, and the captions, and the sound effects, and the titles. Uh, it was at that point. It was a very small, tight knit group. It was Stan and Don Heck and Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, uh, Larry Lieber, mm -hmm. um, one or two others. But I mean, it was this very tight, compact unit, really. Of people who knew, had worked together for a long time before the Marvel superheroes. They worked on the Marvel monsters right. books. And don't forget, at the same time this stuff is coming out. Stan and Marvel are still putting out Millie the Model and the Rawhide Kid. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, so, so, I mean, everybody remembers the superheroes of Marvel. They were limited to like eight or ten comics a month for various contractual reasons. We don't have to get in here, but they focused on these comics. Uh, so, should we just sort yeah. of move along? Yeah, we'll keep on going down. I love seeing Now, this was a one shot cover. Yeah. Uh, in 68, Marvel got out from under that restriction for numerous reasons, so they could print as. You know, they didn't have to just print uh, eight comics a month. And so as they gave each of the characters solo series, Iron Man and Submariner sort of had leftover half-issue stories, so they combined <laughs> them for this special once-in-a-lifetime issue. This is it. How could you not spend your 12 cents for that once in a... It was all, once, it's only going to happen once in your lifetime. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a lunar eclipse and, and a monster invasion at the same time. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the cover is by... Now, the artist who... Uh, uh, Bill Everett had, was the guy who actually created the Submariner in 1939, mm -hmm. and he had come back to Marvel. Uh, and he... Uh, and he it looks like he inked the cover. It looked like Gene Colan, who was the Iron Man artist, drew probably both figures, and then Bill did the ink art over them. Um, so that's that cover. This is uh, a sus Marvel before the superheroes, and even while the superheroes were are being produced, they put out all sorts of science fiction and fantasy and uh, weird happenstance stories. So this was one that was uh, from, let's see, 19, from Tales of Suspense 27. So this is a, literally a year before Iron Man started appearing in Tales of Suspense. Uh, it's a story written by Stan, uh, drawn by Kirby and Ayers, who would go on to do the Fantastic Four and a lot of other material together. But these, these were stories that had no continuing characters. They were just weird, a lot like the Twilight Zone, right? And there would be you know, two or three of these kind of backup stories, but by the same personnel doing the heroes, or the same, you know, now this one was plotted by Stan, and his brother Larry would then take the plots and do, and literally sketch them out panel by panel, and then he would make uh, type up scripts that would then be given to the artist. So that's not, that's not so much what's come to be called the Marvel method, but it's, right. um, but it was those same people. Uh, this is a more, this is a 1989 pinup by uh, John uh, Romita Sr. I guess he penciled it and inked it. It's, it's Spider-Man as he was looking. I guess it looks like it might have been done for a poster. Yeah. It's Spider-Man as he was looking more or less in the late 80s with... Uh, Venom and the Kingpin and Dr. Octopus and uh, got some Hobgoblin two, in the back. Stone, the Hobgoblin. So that was kind of the Spider Man status quo in the late 80s. And that's uh, John Romita was one of the two or three artists yeah. most identified with Spider Man. Yeah. Maybe one of the two, you know. Uh, and really, many, many people go, let's move over to this one. This was something that John did 
it's great to see it there. In, the, uh, in, in 1968, Marvel was experimenting with putting out kind of a larger format, black and white um, comics that um, uh, were, were um, the artists could give more attention to them. And they were also could be, um, I don't think they did anything risque, but they were outside the comic code, kind of like the uh, Interesting. Warren magazines. It says no code symbol. Yeah, how did they get to... Because it was a magazine somehow adding okay. an inch on either side put you in a whole different category. A different technicality. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's really interesting. I mean, I don't know if Dr. Wortham would have found that convincing, but, <laughs> you know, but somehow the distributors did. Right. And this is, this is a classic pose uh, oh, it's done by John Romita. Classic, yeah. uh, the actual comic that came out had a painted cover, I think, based on this drawing. Mm -hmm. um, if not, then it was a full-color rendition of it. But it was... It was definitely not put out as black and white, but that's the uh, original art from it. And it was 35 cents. You could buy three regular comics for that, so you had to get, be getting your money's worth. There was a, you know, it, was, it was an experiment that didn't last long. I think, that, I think retailers at the time in those dark ages before comic book shops mm -hmm. didn't really know what to do with it. Was it yeah. a magazine? Was it a comic? And for a kid, it's like, 35 cents? What, am I made of money? You know, so... <laughs> um, but that, that's just a beautiful Romita drawing. Um, this one, as this is one this, I this, love. This is, this is a classic. This is from 1967. Um, well, it's December 60s, right? So yeah, it would have come out in like the fall. The cover dates were always two or three months ahead of when the comics actually right. come out, especially back then. Um, and this is, I'll see, I'm guessing, that, I'm guessing he did not draw that figure twice. I'm guessing you drew it once, and then made a they made a, a duplicate of it and, and put it right. in the eyelid. Drew it as a and square the, and then right, cut it out twice. Right, right. Um, but it's you know it, it, it's a great comic device to see the you know the person that the, the uh, that's Doctor Octopus and of course that's so you see Spider Man reflected in his eyepiece and that way you get to have two Spider Man on the cover. Um, and it's just a fantastic, it's one of, I feel like it's one of those really iconic early covers of Spider-Man. Right. This is an image of the second I walked into the room, I went, oh my god, I've read that issue, I know that issue, and that's really exciting, because this is literally a moment in history that is right. here. Like, something like that is really exciting, because, you know, a character like Doc Ock, we've seen a thousand times before, but so to see the early materials and see... The way that this character has grown over time, right. seeing the early Romita stuff, and obviously Stan wrote the first, you know, hundred issues right. of Spider-Man. Well, so it's, it's very cool. When you say it's early, this is issue fifty-five. So that means like it's like well, but, but it's I, on I, well, issue. Yeah. It's, it's, it's eight hundred and something now. <laughs> right, right. But, but I mean, say it's it's still that's four years of Spider-Man. Right. Uh, which in the old days, again, in the pre-comic shop days, you might have while well, you had a lot of kids who would, you know, would stick around and, and are reading them to this day, mm. you also had a lot of turnover. Oh, of so, course. So Marvel had to figure out, and you see everybody had to figure out, how do you deal with, right, for years, in the first 20 years, 25 years of comics, they were just for children. You know, yeah. A few fans and a few GIs, but mainly children. And then, oh, suddenly there's an audience of kids who grow into teenagers, grow into adults, how do you keep things interesting for them and, and change them up? But you're right, they have been another... 800 issues yeah. <laughs> since then but um, so this, this but this is like late early period Spider-Man when Stan was still uh, writing it and he and Romita were plotting and Romita was drawing yeah um, and as I said like, I don't know how much else they would say it's an iconic cover yeah let's great. keep it going we'll keep on going yeah okay now, a lot of this stuff is really fun because it comes from a lot more of the, the stuff like you were saying, like the Tales of Astonish, Tales of Suspense, the kind of the, the wealth of the early Marvel publishing line. Right. Well, some of this, this stuff over here, I think Stan was not directly involved in. This is mm -hmm. more, if this issue he was the, uh, he would have been the editor of, this, this Hulk story. So Stan would have had to approve anything of this, but he, he was not involved with writing it. Yeah. And they would put, because Stan was the, even then, probably the best known name in comics, mm -hmm. they put his name first as editor, which, you know, it's, that's, that's rare. There are very few editors in the world. There's, there were one or two, um, maybe Charles Viro over, if, if you historians in the crowd might know that name, Lev Gleason, one or two people 
who were not writers or artists could sell a book, but, but they knew that Stan was this known quantity. Later that became Stanley Presents. Uh, this ARG, um, I have no idea. This, Stan had stopped editing. Roy was the editor, Roy Thomas. So I don't know if Stan was involved with ARG um, or with um, or this 1976 uh, issue of Spider-Man, but it's it's well, a great cover. Would he have been cover. the editor of the line at that point? No, he was the publisher. Publisher. Yeah, so he would. He was still in the office, and he was still advising. And I think for major issues, he would he would be involved. Right. You know. Well, that is a major issue. We've well, got the spider I, I mean, issues between you know? like I, I meant issues <laughs> in the sense of conflict oh, between people. <laughs> Not spider buggy right. related issues. So I mean, I think the spider buggy. I think somebody. At you know, in in some other department, made a deal with a toy oh, company course, yeah. for a spider buggy, and so they had to have it in the story. So I I I, I would imagine Stan had to at, at, have some input or approval at some point about the spider buggy, but I I doubt he was that this was a story he was especially interested in, <laughs> uh, involved in rather. He, I'm, I'm sure he was interested. Oh, of course, it's uh, the spider buggy. The spider buggy. Yeah. This is an Avengers cover. Do we know, was this, was this a uh, used cover, or this might be a cover that wasn't used? I have a feeling this was a discarded cover, um, because, and, and uh, you can see why. Because if you're looking at it, and if you're, if you're an Avengers fan, you want to see one of the Avengers. Captain right. America, Hawkeye, or the Giant Man, the Wasp, or the Scarlet Witch, or the Quicksilver. They're there. Or they're off on the side. There's Captain on the side. Giant Man is really just kind of... His costume, in general, is not that distinct. So I, I'm pretty sure this cover was rejected, ultimately, and a mm. different cover was used, where you could, really, you know... Clearly right, distinguish the right, characters Yeah, because right now you're looking at it thinking, oh, this is a Mr. Robot cover. Now, of course, somebody out there can look that up and tell me if I'm wrong and completely full of it, but I believe <laughs> this was a rejected cover. Um, not but it's still gorgeous. Yeah, not, well, yeah. that's why it's up. The artistic ability is It's beautifully is still drawn. There. Don yeah. Heck is one of the great geniuses of comics. Uh, so he's got the elements. You know, and look, Stan might have even, you know, I'm sure Stan approved the sketch or the idea. Right. But as an editor, if any of you have done any editing or just, you know, you have an idea and then, it, then you see the realization of it. And suddenly it's like, oh, that's not, oh, yeah. that's not you, working. Yeah. If you look at something at a two-inch yeah, yeah. scale versus, you know, foot tall, yeah. yeah. it's going to look different. Or, or even, or even if, or even if, whatever, Stan was out of the office and it just yeah. went through without going through it. Who knows? You know. <coughs> uh, this is a story that was in Tales of Suspense again, about a year and a half before Iron Man. So no, this is this is actually cover dated the exact same date as the first Fantastic Four, which was the first Marvel comic. Wow. First modern Marvel. Comic. Right. If you, if you consider 1961 modern. <laughs> um, and so again, what Marvel was doing was cowboy stories, teen humor stories, romance stories, and, you know, offbeat kind of fantasy stories. And this is, a, this is another one done, plotted by Stan, scripted, you know, in a full, what's called a full script, where every panel is described right. and every piece of dialogue is written in advance by uh, his brother, Larry Lieber, and drawn by Jack Kirby and Saul, and inked by Saul Brodsky, who, again, you, Saul was also the production manager. He was, uh, a lot of what we think of as early Marvel, uh, Saul was involved with either as inker or, or logo designer or production guy or strategist. Mm -hmm. um, here's another, another one of those stories. This is by, this is signed very emphatically by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko. <laughs> Ditko, of course, uh, this is October 62. This so would have, this, this would have been, this would have been right after Spider-Man was introduced in yeah. Amazing Fantasy 15, but before his own magazine came out in, right. in the early... During that little in early, early 63. Um, so, but Stan and Steve had worked together a lot. They, like, like Stan and Kirby, you know, and I know everybody knows stories. They didn't get along, they didn't get along, they love each other, they hate each other. Yes, all that. Um, and this, but they, but they worked, there was a groove they had of working together. Uh, Stan really loved working with Ditko on these kind of Twilight Zone type, yeah, um, fantasy, His weird stories. His sensibilities play so well to them too. 
they, they did, and, 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 and they always had like a little O. Henry twist ending. Uh, and Ditko, you know, just always brought mood to everything, everything he did. Um, and Artie Simic's lettering, you can't uh, discount that. That was always a, Art, Artie Simic and, uh, and, and um, Sam Rosen were the two main letterers at Marvel in the early days. Who A lot of what we think of as the look and feel of Marvel comes from the lettering. And then, of course, there's Stan's. Uh, or, yeah, this one, yeah, this one is... Right, if Stan signed it, then he, you know, this is not, this is, no, this is not one that Larry scripted. So right. many men had searched for pen in vain, but perhaps it was better to have searched and failed far, far better than to have found him. <laughs> you know what I mean. So, um, uh, and, 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 and this is one he did with Jack Kirby, um, a similar kind of thing. Now, this is signed by Kirby and Ayers and not by Stan. So the card says Stan scripted it, and uh, I, I imagine uh, whoever wrote the card researched it. Um, but this was yet another kind of, um, this, this came out in June 62. So Fantastic Four was already coming out. Maybe the Hulk was coming out yeah. already. Uh, I don't know, it's, I'm not this strange tale, I'm not sure if the Human Torch was, was having a solo, uh, a feature in, in the Strange Tales yet, but this is during the very early Marvel period, and the same team that was doing the, a lot of that early Fantastic Four. And so Kirby just, you know, it's like a Kirby cityscape, but suddenly frozen and covered with snow, and these two weird, these, these, these are actually, these, these kind of people would end up in Kirby's Eternals, uh, and, yes. and, uh, and, and New Gods later on. You know, so those are, Jack's, Jack's, yeah, uh, Jack's kind of, you know, wise, wise old uh, patriarch kind of looking guys. Old father time right. looking guys. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and again, these were, you know, like the Outer Limits, the Twilight Zone, just like uh, Black Mirror, I guess, would be a modern equivalent, just weird one-off short stories. Um, this is another classic Romita cover. Yeah. Um, a story written by Stan and drawn by John Romita Sr. Uh, Same I, period as the other one, yeah, just a few yeah, issues yeah. later. And it's like 10, yeah, the Kingpin was introduced in issue 50, so, so there, I, I don't think uh, there must have been a gap where they maybe weren't fighting each other. Frank Miller later took the Kingpin in Daredevil in the uh, 80s and really amplified his importance as a villain, but he was yeah. still... You know, a pretty. You know, if, if you know your if you know your old time movies, you know he looks like um, uh, the guy from Casablanca. Um, his name I'm blanking on. Yeah. Uh, well, it'll come to me after the show. Can't is remember over. the name now either. Put in the blank. Sydney in Green Street. Sydney Green Street. <laughs> Sydney yes. Green Street in Casablanca. That I think he's sort of based on like sort of a, you know, a amped up, muscled up, bulked up. You know, scary, scarier version. The Sydney Grinch is pretty scary on his own. <laughs> you know. uh, so enough said on this one, yeah. I think. Then we got a nice old, big old Spidey on the wall. A Ditko Spider-Man. Ditko blown up. Which, uh, In way. gotta love it. I do think it's funny because, you know, it, just, it doesn't say Ditko on it. I, you know it's yeah, Ditko. You know Ditko is so distinct. Although, so, you know, it's certainly to get it this big, it's possible somebody kind of translated it. So, oh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's obviously based on a Ditko. Yeah. You know, the, the, the webbing is so blurry, maybe it actually was blown up from the Ditko. Yeah, yeah well, that, you know, like, yes. <laughs> but it doesn't, say, it doesn't say, that's no credit, so no. there's no human is credited. This is one of the coolest things I yeah. see here, because I love seeing, this is clearly a change was made. Yes, a change was made. This was, this was the cover uh, drawn by Jim Steranko, who... Uh, most of you probably know who he is. He's Jim Steranko. Yeah. He he was. He defined he was and Nick is Fury one of, and Captain America. He defined Nick America. Fury and was a really uh, tran transitional figure at Marvel and at comics in general. Um, he really brought a a pop art sensibility uh, to comics. He brought in a lot of influences from Kurtzman to Eisner to Kirby. You know, he just he. Uh, you know, Jerry Robinson was, I think, an influence. So he did this cover for what had become his trademark series, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And you can see uh, Stan experimenting with cover copy here, because that's Stan's writing. And here, 
you know, just featuring the great Captain America. I think in the, it looks like there may even, no, yeah, it says the great. I thought I might say the grand, but it looks like the great. Uh, and then here it says, change and tell Steranko. Um, so what they did was, I think Stan, I think Stan had an issue with some of the anatomy on this, on this figure of Captain America. So they did what, took what's called a photostat, which is kind of an, a, a Xerox kind of thing, but you needed big machines and smelly chemicals, and it took 15 minutes for it to process. <laughs> it, no, it was, they were literally giant cameras, so they made a photostat of it so that they wouldn't damage the original, because I, I think Jim uh, would not have been pleased if they did art, if they did corrections on his original, which they would often do right. in those days. So I think John Romita, yep, John signed it, so John did this Captain America figure and put it in that spot on the stat and added some, uh, some like, uh, glare. Kind of glare and the yeah. explosion. I don't know, explosion. A little pizzazz. Glare or, or sparks. They had some sparks. Which really, at this, I don't even, I wonder if this even came out in the original cover. It's so fine detail. Um, but it, it, you know, he did it more in the, in the Jack Kirby vein, and Kirby was the original artist who yeah. co created Captain America with Joe Simon. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, but it, this is a thing that happens and happens a lot in comics where something's in the office and it needs a change. And I, I guess, I guess these days you can do things digitally so you can send it back to the original artist. But certainly right. back in the day when there was an issue with, you know, with the, the post office or, or even FedEx and if you needed something going to the printer immediately, and you had people on staff or sometimes a freelancer would be in delivering work and he'd be grabbed and sat down at a <laughs> table to do the correction. Uh, so that, this is one of those cases, you know, sort of behind which, you know, again, most kids would not have had any reason to know or care about. Right. This is from Wild Western 46. It's by Joe Manili. Uh, it's from 1955. So Stan was... Uh, Pretty definitely the editor. At 55, uh, Timely Atlas Marvel, went by all three names, had a, they were the, lo they put out the most comics of any company in the industry. Mm -hmm. They're putting out about 70 or 75 okay. comics a month. So whether Stan edited this personally or whether he delegated it to somebody like Al Jaffe who was on staff there, no, ja mm -hmm. no Jaffe only did humor books. But what, who, he might have probably delegated to somebody, but Joe Manili, the cover artist, uh, was a good friend of Stan's and his favorite artist, and, and probably the top before Kir when Kirby was away from Marvel uh, in the 50s. Manili was one of the top artists, if not the top artist. He was really good, really imaginative, really fast. And, that's uh, like the trifecta that's right the there. That's the trifecta. And, and he and Stan, they, they, were, they did a, news, a, a newspaper strip together. Um, called Mrs. Lyons Cubs, but Manili died in a commuter train accident in 1958 oh, goodness. at age 32. That's like the big, the big what if is, what if Joe Manili had lived, you know, would he have been, would he have been the guy to do the Marvel books, or yeah. would he have been the Marvel books, and you know, if he had been the guy, what would Kirby have done? Um, but if you can sort of, you know, if you look up Joe Manili, if you don't know his work, uh, Michael Vassallo uh, writes a lot about him online. Um, just a fascinating uh, character. A guy really born to draw comics in the sense that he had that trifecta. Yeah. You know, so... Well, and even something like this that could, by somebody else's hand, be like a relatively simple shot. Right. Like, there's a dynamicism to this where you've got the leap, you've got the action, the... The detailing is really fantastic. I'm actually staring at the, right. the sleeve work right, right there. Silly little stuff like that, but that shows, that's reflective of a... And that's really above and beyond what was oh, demanded of it. really, him, really you is. Know? Uh, and obviously, you can see here, there must have been some uh, cover, you know, here, here where the blurbs were. Yeah. And, the, and, you know, so this was called Wild Western. So I guess, oh, you can even see Wild would have been up here. That's the uh, ID. That, 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 that's who the wholesaler was. Right. More, more than you need to know. <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe it's not more than you need to know. <laughs> now this, uh, I, this I was staring at uh, for yeah. a while. This is a gorgeous page. It's a gorgeous page, um, and it's written... Now, clearly, something went on. Because if you read this essay, what's <laughs> fascinating is Stan would often... 
you know, as a kid, this meant nothing. We had announced another artist, but these two guys, but Dick and uh, Dick is on vacation, but Steve Ditko and George. I mean, it's like an essay. That I mean, as a twelve-year-old or a ten-year-old, go. Why, why, it, uh, I don't. Why? Why am I getting? You know, or, or you just like read past it. Right. But clearly, Stan, which is he would share stuff with kids that kids could not under. It's only reading this stuff as an adult that I go, because clearly something happened, and we announced another artist would draw this strip. He's not naming that person, so clearly he's pissed off at the guy. <laughs> <laughs> he right. He wants to right. He wants to embarrass him in in print, but he doesn't want to name his name because he's not that mean. But he's pissed off, and then. And then Dick Ayers went on vacation. Well, why do I care that Dick Ayers went on vacation? But somehow Stan felt important for, to know. And then and Steve Ditko quickly penciled and George Bell. And then and, and again, you're right. It's a beautifully drawn cover. But look how weird it is, right? The word balloons are underneath the artwork. Yeah. Right. So there must have been somebody must have done something. Or, you know, maybe. And they cut around. And they it. cut around it because I mean. This is generally, you know, this is balloon placement 101 is don't put a balloon that covers a person's entire body, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this is just interesting in terms of process, in terms of personal relationships, in terms of behind the scene, the scene stuff at the bullpen. But what's great about, you know, now, now we have computers, kids. But back <laughs> in the day, back in the day, it was a big... Pro- it was a big deal to get a, a box of text typed up. You had to write it, then you had to, somebody had to type it up. Then it had to go to the typesetter. That was a whole job of somebody just typesetting. Mm-hmm. So even, even if Stan had looked at this and said, you know, maybe kids don't want to know this, but we don't have an hour or two hours to like have it go back to the typesetter and come back because right. the printer is waiting for it. Because it's probably late, which is why they had these fill-in guys. Anyway... So stuff like this is, is, is I, I think, is an interesting oh, it, inside it baseball such a stuff. Unique insight. Um, let's see. This is uh, again. I'm not sure. Stan would have been the editor. This came out in it's January '68. Dated, so it would have come out in '67, around the time of the Galactus trilogy. Yeah. But Marvel's also putting that kid called Outlaw. Yeah. Um, and so this cover is by Werner Roth, who, who drew X Men for a time, inked by Herb Trimpey. So it's interesting, kind of. That it's an old school artist mixed with, with a couple uh, guys. Well, a new guy, well like, you know, Trimpy, who was an, then at that point a new guy. You know? Right. So um, and and you know again a beautifully drawn cover, and, and as the as with that other western, I think I think people just liked western. I think these western souls, you know, it's kind of like people who like westerns were not that picky. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think they just oh I like westerns. I'll yeah. read another. But I mean, it also has to be a great cover. You yeah. Know? So, um, but I just think, and I think the guys drawing it, you can just see there's way more work put in this than is that, than is necessary. Yeah. So, uh, that's all I got on that. Here, yeah. here, here's another Lee Ditko fantasy story. This is from uh, Tales to Astonish 40. So, Ant Man would already have been appearing for like half a year. Uh, so it was already, you know, be, again because of that distribution. Because they were limited in the number of comics they could put out, they had these split books. Right. So the superhero thing would be, until they had enough superheroes um, or enough perceived demand for superheroes, they still would have these filler fantasy stories. That the legacy from Tales to Astonish was all fantasy. So this is just another great splash page by Steve Ditko. Yeah. You know, and again, Stan never afraid to have giant arrows. Oh, he's at the year 2000. <laughs> oh my god <coughs> I didn't even want to think about what life will be like in 2000 well let's we'll see we'll have the fl- there, are, there are no flying cars per se but certainly we've got giant men though. we've got giant men and, uh, and ray guns and ray guns and, 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 and futuristic architecture my favorite detail is that not only do we have giant men we have giant jewels because <laughs> that's those, true those jewels must be gi- right well, I, I think it's might be more of a symbolic it's possible yeah Could but, be but diamonds are forever right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we've got this darling, uh, darling shot of Stan, right, this looking is, all dapper. This is Stan from the from the early '80s, I would say. Yeah, I was saying his hairstyle is early '80s. Um, That's and great. Right in front of those uh, books and a photo, and then but next to him is an issue of My Love, the love stories thrillingly told. <laughs> That's how you, you want your love. You don't want them 
you know, lackadaisically told. He wanted him thrillingly told. Um, tales of love that could be yours. Um, Stan used to, I think he enjoyed writing romance as much as anything. I think, I think what Stan brought to comics, what made Marvel Marvel in large part, was that Stan and, the, and his artists were so expert in so many genres that, that the Marvel comics were not just superheroes, they were superheroes with romance and with fantasy and with uh, science fiction. You know, they took all these different, and, and with humor, you know, I mean, so much of Marvel was about the characters wisecracking and saying, like, inappropriate, funny things. And I, and I think this, this, uh, this fed in, you know, these romance ones. So Stan would write these. I guess he, he didn't want it just to be an omniscient narrator. He wanted it to be told first, you know, my love. So the credits would right, read it's very as, possessive. So the credits would read as told to Stan Lee. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> where to next? Uh, well, unfortunately, I think that's what we're going to call it for now. Oh just so people have we're more reason to come on through. Okay. Um, so we're here at the Society of yes. Illustrators. There's tons of stuff for you guys to enjoy. So please yes. come by and look forward to the marvelous life of Stan Lee. Yes, and, and, and thank you. And, and may I just say that also, if you come to the Society. You know, the Stan stuff is uh, uh, one part of the building, but there's also a Brenda Starr by yes. Dale Messick, if you're a fan of Brenda Starr or comics history. That's some great there's stuff. There's some gorgeous and, stuff I was looking at earlier. And just come here. They're great events, and uh, enough said? Yeah, enough said. <laughs> okay.